registry and she'd been. And so I did some other training and I met this woman who had this other uh, agency and it was a lot, it was a referral company and I made a lot more money and things just took off. I got a job, um, I, an OB, I worked with an OB because his wife had a baby and uh, she was in the hospital and I took care of the baby while she was still in the hospital. And he introduced me to this woman who was married to the guy that owned the Venetian hotel in Vegas. So I went there for three months of 24 hour shifts. And this is, I was much younger. I never do 24 hour shifts anymore, but a lot of people still do. But I had, I made the money and I was able to build my website and that's where I did it. And the rest is history. You know, I, started getting lots of work and um you know back in the day if you if you couldn't take a job what you would do is you would call your do other doula friends and say can you take a job i started getting work that i said i can't sit on the phone and find jobs for these people anymore so i started a registry of my own and now i have about 50 to 70 women on my registry I have an assistant and we, it works like a charm. I give him my spiel about how I'm not available, but I've got other people. Cassie sends out an email and we see who's available. And so I still work nights, but I'm now, I've now got the registry. So that's where I'm at to this point. But I now need to reinvent myself again at 70. And what I'm going to do is start doing, I, I can't, I just don't want to do nights anymore of 20 years of nights. So now I'm going to start a virtual uh, course or class for new parents. They're stuck at home. They can't go anywhere anyway with the new baby. So I'll start taking those. And that's what my plan is for my future. That's fantastic, Kathleen. Thank you. Now I know we're going to open it up to Q and A. Um, this is what this is all about: is to pick uh, Kathleen's brain to see uh, all the different things that um, you might be curious about, and um, how she got where she got. Of course, she told you the story, but I'm sure she went through a lot to get there. So we're going to open it up to Q and A. Um, just raise your hand, and we'll call on you. And uh, you can raise your uh, the Zoom hand or your own. Uh, hand and uh, we'll go from there. Who would like to go first? Uh, Letty? I do. I'm fascinated and I did hear a little bit of your story before and you know I'm always amazed for that's like a, such a drastic change and obviously you held on to be a success but uh, what personal characteristics do you think that have contributed to your success? I mean it had to be scary right? <laughs> It, it was scary. It was scary. But, you know, having been in the sales world for 20, 30 years and having the success I had in sales really helped me know that when it comes mm -hmm. to my confidence, I guess, and, and being able to, you know, I, I'm a caregiver by nature, by my profession and I make others feel comfortable very easily. So that's probably my characteristic more than anything is that's why I was successful in sales and that's why I'm successful as a doula. I make others feel comfortable and relaxed. And I think that's probably it, Letty, more than anything. That's awesome, yeah. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. April. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could go back and advise your 20 year old self, what would you tell her and what might you do different in terms of your career? My 20 year old self? Good question. I did, I had a lot of jobs that I wasn't necessarily thrilled about. Um, from ages 20 to 50, 
I mean, well, let's see, at least 20 to 40, I, I guess I would say. I can't even remember what jobs I had, but until I got into sales, it's so funny because I, I worked in offices, you know, and I decided to go into sales. I was working for these two guys that flipped houses in Malibu and the Palisades, and they gave me a car phone for my car because I was their assistant and I was busy and I needed a car phone. And so when I was leaving that position, my assistant said, you know, you love your car phone. Look, there's a job here selling car phones. So I told my dad that I was going to get into sales. And he said, oh, no, no, no. You don't want to do that. You want, <laughs> a, you want a regular paycheck. You've got to depend on a regular nine to five paycheck. If you go into sales, and it was all straight commission, mind you. Uh, and, you know, I heard him, but I still... I had gone on the interview. I kind of liked the idea of it, you know, car phones. This was back in 85, I think, 86 car. It was car phones, not even a flip, you know, not even a handheld. And, and there was very few of us who had them. And when I'd go on an interview to sell the phone, I'd have to bring a notebook to even explain to them how they even worked. Um, but, I, and I remember being so intimidated the very first Monday morning, there was this conference room and there was this salespeople all filled up in this conference room. They were having their sales meeting and I was looking through this window, looking at them. And I thought, oh, how am I ever going to be like these people? I don't know how to sell. I don't know what to do. And by, I don't even know how many months it was because I became the top salesperson and then I was top salesperson there from here on out and even across the nation. And, you know, I think a lot of it is putting one foot in front of the other. You know, you learn what you have to learn and you stumble and, you know, straight commissions difficult. I remember I had to borrow money because that straight commission wasn't going to do it for me in the first couple months, but slowly but surely I got there and so back to the question my 20 year old self I things are so different now there's so many more opportunities there's the internet you know there's so many ways that you can now and there's so many different types of jobs that when I was 20 those things didn't exist so I think anybody who's 20 now has so many opportunities that are placed in front of them that are amazing. So I'd like to be 20 right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, April. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, anybody else? Raquel? You're on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I am in the middle of starting my own business as well. Um, and I think my biggest like stump or where I'm stuck at right now is getting the motivation to like, kind of like continue because I feel like a lot of the things that stop me right now is what if it doesn't succeed? Or what are people gonna think about you for selling this and for doing this? And, you know, and um, as a Hispanic, I was raised to think that you can only go for a nine to five job that's gonna be a stable job. And so I have that now, but I want, I don't want to work for anybody else anymore. I want, like, if I can do it now, I feel like now is the best time to do yes. it. Yes, it, you're absolutely right. And I'll tell you something, the, the idea of insecurity of, am I going to make it is huge. And I don't think there's a person out there who doesn't feel that way. I think that there's huge risks in, you know, starting your own business and it's scary. But again, Raquel, putting one foot in front of the other and knowing that this is your baby, so to speak, you know, 
you, and you've got so much support around you, I think there's no way you wouldn't make it. <laughs> okay, great. Is that um, answer your question, Raquel? All right. Yes, take it okay, one great. step at a time. One step at a time and take advantage of the support you have around me, around you, AKA son of Erst. And the and, whole, and the whole and, woman's of prosperous hearts. And the whole woman of prosperous hearts. All right, um, who, anybody else have any questions? I have a kind of a continuation of my first question. And, um, you know, you go from when you were 20 years old to when you were 50 and now 70. Uh, and I know obviously as we grow and we look at different things, but obviously your the perception of yourself has changed. So mm. again, um, how, because I, I'm gonna tell you, I tried a couple of um, entrepreneur business and, it, and I, I didn't give it enough, maybe, I don't know, but, fear just stopped me so well, how did you work on um, perception of yourself because it's so much more I, I didn't care what other people thought but what I what I felt that was my hardest challenge you know that's really a good point uh I apparently am pretty driven and I guess I never really thought of myself that way until recently I mean I I'm constantly working. I mean, a lot of it's just sitting around at my house, but I'm still, you know, running the registry, creating new things, creating videos, website, building Instagram, whatever it is. So I, I'm, I'm driven, but it's, it comes natural for me. I, I guess I just, and also back again to my sales, um, career. I was just always looking for the, you know, leads and the next thing I could do or whatever. So fear is huge and fear everybody has, you know, but you have to have the willingness to want this and to want it in a way that you've, can't, you have, I didn't have a choice to give up. I had to work. Uh, once I made this decision to work as in sales and then as a postpartum doula, I just never had the option because it was my income. So I just had to do it and keep putting one foot in front of the other. And as you do that, it continues to build and grow. So trust the process. Maybe that's the best in, in answer. Trust the process. And know that if you are determined and you are driven, that it's going to happen. All right. Thank you. Um, Raquel? Yeah, I had actually two other questions. And I don't know if you want me to ask them one at a time or just two of them together. Um, but my first one would be how or what advice would you give uh, and establishing your own voice to take for people for people to take you serious. I feel like very often I'm like soft spoken or like I'll just say yes to anything even if it doesn't benefit me or my business um, that I'm growing. But because I'm such a people pleaser, sometimes I'm willing to take that loss for myself instead mm. of just kind of like be firm and say I'm sorry, but I'm this time I'm gonna have to pass on that. You know? Yeah, I'm exactly the same way. I've always been a people pleaser, but I've learned as I've gotten older, and now you can learn this at your age, which is huge, is to set boundaries. We've got to learn to know when to set boundaries for what is beneficial for us, and not in a selfish way, but in a way where I, I'd love to help you, but I've got my thing that I've got to do, you know, so um really get that setting boundaries and write it on a on the mirror in the bathroom whatever you can do because I am guilty of the same thing and if and also guilty of setting boundaries but I have learned that you have to take care of you and it has to be about you 
it's no one else is going to make it about you. <laughs> so I think that's so important. Okay, great. Did you have a second question, Raquel? Oh, um, yeah. Yes, I did have a second question. Um, how do you manage um, your personal life with your work life with and like having time for everything without overwhelming yourself at the same time? I certainly make that happen. <laughs> I have a huge personal life and a huge work life. Now, you know, it used to be when I first started this job, I do seven nights a week or I do 24 hour shifts, you know, but, and some of my friends still do, but I set boundaries several years ago where I decided that I only wanted to work and I sell them on this. When I talk to them on the phone, they go, well, how much time should we take? You know, what do we need? How much time should we use, use you? And I said, well, sorry, I keep getting these texts. And, um, I say to my clients that are interested in hiring me, I say, I typically do Sunday night through Thursday night. So that's, so that gives me Friday and Saturday off so I can have a social life. But what I do is I word it to them where I say, I give you those two nights so that you guys can kind of get your sea legs and learn about your baby. And then when I come back on Sunday night, you have a lot of questions for me. So you learn from that. So that, that part is kind of like, you know, a tactic where I win and so do they. So that's, does that answer your question? I guess I, yeah, I have a personal life and I have a social and I have a work life. Um, Mary? Yeah, hi, Kathleen. Um, I have a question about um, your value, your own personal values, setting a price. Um, mm. That's something that mm. was natural to you. Um, what kind of process was that for you? It's not natural for me. I get scared to death to raise my prices. I'm still five or $10 per, less per hour than some people <laughs> have less experience than I do. So it's a, it's a big thing. But the good news for me is I'm in a situation where I'm an um, independent contractor and uh, I don't have taxes taken out. So I get a big chunk of change. I have to end up paying taxes, of course. But, um, you know, I work 10 hour shifts. So it's good money. But it takes everything... I, I was $35 an hour forever and I couldn't go to 40 when everybody else in my experience level was. So I went to 38. I couldn't say 40. So I went to 38 and I was stuck there forever. And then just recently I've opened my mouth and said 40. Now, of course, I'm starting to say 45. Um, but I'm always afraid, afraid. You know, but those women who have the experience who set that price range higher than than the, the rest of them? I I really admire them because it's about your self worth. And if I have to divulge anything here right now, it would be that I have insecurities about my self worth, even though I've been successful. So, I think once you feel once you feel that you are skilled in some arena. It's, it behooves you to put a price that is in the market that's acceptable, but also above and beyond what the norm is. What that's do you mean by that? What the norm is? Like what, what the norm is? Like I don't know what. What is your? What is your? Uh, what field are you in, Mary? I'm a, an artist, so okay. I need to set prices for my artwork. Yeah. Art is probably the most volatile arena you can be in as far as setting price, because as we know, art is so subjective. And there's some art out there that goes for 
millions of dollars and it's nothing that a lot of people would be interested in. But I think art, I mean, there's, there's art reps, aren't there? I think you should have an art, what, do you have an art rep? Cause I know they- uh, No. Cause an art rep I know is somebody who will market your art but they're good at setting the price tone because they're, it's their world and they are familiar with it. Right. How long have you been doing this? 20 years at least. And what has your success been with selling it? Um, I really haven't tried to sell it. I just um, paint to paint. To pay, of course. But I'm, I'm going to start pricing my work now because I have a website and I need to cover costs at least. Yes. But I know that especially as women, I think I tend to underprice and be concerned and immediately want to discount people. Yeah. And it's oh, like, why am I doing that? You know? I know. But if I were you, I'd have some paintings where the price is really high, but it's slashed and there's a sale. So it's reducing it just to get people to buy. You know, if everything is let's arbitrarily say $7,000, you know, you're, it's, you're hesitant to sell it. But if there is that whole thing, and I guess this goes back to sales, you know, you, you invent a reason for them to want to buy. And if by having a few of those paintings with the slash and, and, you know, ones that you wouldn't normally sell for 7,000, you'd normally sell for 2,500, put 700, slash it, and then put or 7,000 and then put two to 2,500. You're still getting what you want, but it's the illusion that they're getting a deal. But Mary, you got to get a, you got to get an art rep. Okay. I'm, I want you to look into that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks You're for welcome. your answer. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kathleen. Anyone else have a question? I see that Melissa's here. Kim's here. Who else is over there? And Senia, she was uh, one of the speakers at our one of our events. And oh. yeah, oh, Brittany's here. Hi. How are you? Oh, Brittany has a question. Yes. So Kathleen, you, I know you're a newborn care specialist. Um, I am as well. I work with your agency. And I want- Are you Brittany? Oh my God. I am. Yeah. Five minutes before this, I got the email saying you wanted to work with that client in Los Feliz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I thought, oh, I got to let Cassie know right away. Yeah, oh, thank you. That's I wanted to know. You said something that um, kind of stood out to me. You said that there was a you raised your rate when you felt like you had enough experience, and so did that come with you're having hands-on experience or when you felt like you had enough education behind you or like, or was it a combination of both? It's an excellent question. I have two women on my registry that have probably two years experience. Mm -hmm. Their name is mine. And I'll tell you, it bugs me. <laughs> It drives me nuts. I well, I don't even want to give them the jobs because you got to earn your stripes, so to speak. Right. You've got to be able to. So yeah. So it's it's definitely a track record that to me, enough families under your belt. Training is nothing compared mm -hmm. to what you're going to learn with each individual family. So, so definitely, uh, I would say. You know, I just raised the rates for after the birth to 38. Um, and if, um, what, what is your rate right now? It's about that. It's about 38. And some, I mean, sometimes it's 40, sometimes it's 35. It kind of just depends on the assignment. Yeah. How long have you been a doula? Um, so I've actually, I nanny for 10 years. And within that time, I would say I have like, five or six years of the newborn experience. Um, and I've just, I've been consistently as the title of newborn care specialist for the last like year or two. Year or two. Okay. Mm -hmm. So definitely have the, experience of the nanny 
work with families. Um, who'd you do your training with? Uh, I took two trainings. So it was Gentle Ventures at first and then um, a Newborn uh, Care Solutions um, with Tanya. And then yeah. I took a sleep training course with uh, Summer Hartman. Yeah. Uh, because you t- trained with Tanya, you know, that gives you a big leg up. And um, so I would say, look, at I'm, I'm now 45 the registry is at 38. I think you're at 30. I think 38 is a good number for you. 40. Absolutely. I was just curious as to what you kind of felt like in your, in your situation, when did you start to feel confident about going in and saying, Hey, this is what I would prefer. Yeah. I still don't feel confident. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. But but I don't want to give, I don't want to let you down. I, I, I think I admire that people are confident about a fee, a rate, but I don't feel that that's valuable and worth it if they don't have enough under their belt to earn it. Okay. I do have one more question for you. When you do work with agencies, and I understand the argument is not that I don't understand why you need to have a fee and et cetera. You have things to pay for on the back end. Um, When you work with an agency that's referring you, how do you sort of word what it is that you need? So say there's a family and I would typically ask them for 35, but because I want to make 35, I want to net that, um, yeah. I might ask for 38 or 40. Like, how do you then articulate why your why for asking for that higher price range? That's a good question. Kim, in here for that. Kim, you have to unmute yourself. Kim, you're on mute. Kim, you have to unmute. I know, I know, I had to find it. Hold on. Okay, Okay. all right. Um, Okay, what is the question? How do you approach, how do you ask a, a client for the higher rate? Like, what do you feel qualifies you to ask for a higher rate? If no, when, so when you're with an agency that has a fee, oh. for example, 10%, um, but you want to make sure that you net what it is that you normally do. So say 35, yeah. oh, but you I, have to raise your rate oh. to 40. Yes. Yeah. But I How wouldn't go to 40. That? Like <clears throat> I've done it before because when I have to pay, if I have to pay 10% and I, because I only recently started charging $35 an hour. So um, when I was charging $30 an hour, I would charge 33 because that would be my 10%. That three extra dollars would be the 10%. So if it was 35, I would just try to add another $4 on. I just like for me, and I think Kathleen's the same way, but she's been doing it so long and she's got such a reputation. For me, I really am in a support role. Of course, I want to make money, but this is not necessarily a business that you're going to get, you know, <laughs> Woo-hoo, you know, great riches and, uh, you know, you're going to work hard and you're going to work for every penny basically. So I, I work, work with family. I love the people that I work with, you know, it's a very intimate relationship. So I haven't gotten to that point where I feel comfortable. Um, I haven't, I've never charged $40. Um, and I would love to, but I'm just not quite there yet. I've just been doing this for just, you know, under five years. And, um, I think you know, what, the question I, was, if she asked, how would you word it if you did ask for a little bit more? I, I no, so just, in order my to rate. not toss the agency under the bus, like, hey, yeah. I'm being charged 10%. I'm asking for a higher rate at this point because I need to be able to net what I need. How would you word that to a family? I don't and, tell them anything. I just say my rate. Okay. Honestly, I just say my rate. But I was in sales too. I met Sana and Kathleen. We were all in sales together. And I just put out the price and, you know, especially if it's three fit, you know, if it's $35 and, you know, or it's say you're asking for, yeah, $35. So then you need to get 3850 to cover that. So you could say, you know, well, my rate's $40, but you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give it to you, you know, come down to 38, whatever. I don't know. I just would always, I, I hadn't really gone into detail with it. I don't really tell them it's not really, that's my business with the agency. That's just my opinion my business with the agency. So I just come right out with the, you know, the fee, this is my fee. You You know, know, sometimes it costs, has it cost? Does that make sense? 
Uh, it, it makes sense. Um, but what I'm saying also is like, for example, I've had this happen and that, and the client is like, oh, we were fully prepared to pay like 35 and they want to go forth. But that extra three, five or whatever is, it, it's kind of putting them in a tight position. Yeah. And so it then costs you the opportunity altogether. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So I haven't well, done it. So I don't really have an, uh, an experience there. I, I, Okay. I would, you know, I'd probably drop my rate, but that's just me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I dropped me, it to the 35. I don't know. When you originally said, it, you said agency. So I thought you meant an actual agency. I'm a registry. So there's a big difference. I see. So, but with that said, I get that you want to add more to that. And you have, I, I always say the rates for the people on my registry are about $35 an hour. So if a client wants less, maybe someone's gonna go for it. If you wanna add the percentage on there so that you can make what you need to, absolutely do it, but you are gonna run the risk of possibly. And you know what, if they say it's too much, go down a buck or two. Right. You know, don't, don't. it can't be all or nothing. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I understand what you're saying and I, now that I've raised my fee, that's why I raised your guys, your fee. So start saying, you know, start saying 40. Right. <laughs> yeah. Just say it. And then if they go, oh, I wasn't in, you know, then you can say, well, I really want to work with you, you know? And so would, yeah. would $38 be okay or whatever you feel comfortable with. But yeah. um, I, would you explain the whole fee situation, Kathleen? Like, oh, Kathleen, I have Kathleen, we have four minutes Um, because oh. I oh, know I, you have a deadline, but um, is this particular question, could you talk to Brittany one-on-one about it? I think the uh, material was really valuable. The question was valuable, oh. Brittany. I think a lot of people have the same issue, um, asking for more money. So I appreciate the yeah. question. It I is just wanna make sure we finish with the same timeline. Um, is that all right, Brittany? Of course, thank since you so much. For... Since you know Kathleen intimately and you're discussing your industry, is that Absolutely. all right? Absolutely. I appreciate that. And thank you, Kim, for chiming in. Um, did Kathleen, did you want to add any last words? Just that it was a pleasure to thank you guys for all the questions. And it was a pleasure and I'm happy to have shared my life, um, my work life and all that with all of you and I'm excited for Sana and uh, obviously someone's here. My dog is freaking out. Um, Women of Prosperous Hearts. This is a great, an amazing thing that she's doing and I'm thrilled to be part of it. I really appreciate Kathleen being on today's um, uh, Journey of Prosperity. Our next uh, speaker is, our video will be coming out in the middle of uh, September, it will be Raquel De Paz, our mentee. Um, she'll be we, uh, hoping to get a whole crowd of young people that can have ask Q&A from her. So that will be our next person. And we'll have uh, this every month. So we'll send out the video. The, uh, following that is Carolyn Horry, and she is a, um, a life coach. She'll be talking. And then we have Ancinia right here. Um, she was on, she's going to be our one in December and she was part of, um, kill the killing field. And she just wrote a book that's coming out and she's looking to, um, you know, start a film. So we're, this is going to be exciting journey and, um, we'll keep you posted. If you want to be part of this, uh, just register, um, that you want to have the newsletter so we can update you what's going on on a continuous basis. So Kathleen, we really appreciate your time. I know you're a very busy lady and I really appreciate all the guests tonight. Um, you guys were really generous to come on the call tonight. We really appreciate it. So thank you. I, think, I hope it was valuable and uh, hope to see you next month. Thank you so much. Have a good sure. evening. Okay. Can I ask uh, Kathleen a quick question? Okay. Or just a little tidbit. Um, I don't know, Kathleen, I know you're trying to reinvent yourself. Um, if you've ever thought about doing a podcast. Yes, I have. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Just this um, 
Dawn is Dawn has been one of the original um, uh, members of Women's of Prosperous Hearts, and as she posted tonight, one of her mentors uh, is training on how to do podcasts. Is that yeah. correct, Dawn? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, she did a master class uh, yesterday, but you know it's still open for enrollment. If you are curious, she's really good uh, at what she does. I I absolutely am interested. Okay. So both are on our Facebook page. You can uh, and I'll send you, you her info. Yeah. Of course. Why don't you post it on our Facebook page, Dawn? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. I will. And then if you need to get a hold of each other, you can't find each other on Facebook. Just uh, text me, and I'll send you each other's information. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, thank everyone, you, for joining us tonight. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.